So hi, please have a seat because we have quite a busy afternoon. We have a feeding forward plenary about the workshops. Uh, my name is Cecile. I am very happy to see you that numerous today. Um, maybe before we start, let's say that this is the first time there is a feeding forward conference about the workshops that were run at the pre-conference because you can't attend everything. And the workshop organizers sometimes uh, have the wish to bring you whatever they did and their achievements. So this is what we are going to do today. Some key facts, key figures to start with. Hi, Simon. Can you click? Oh, sorry. I have a click. Let's do it. So here are the key figures. Quite a number of workshop participants and a high number of workshops. We can add to those uh, some events because this year we had the carpentry training and we thank them for what they brought uh, and their special training. We also had the launch of the fifth cohort for the leadership seminar. We won't be dealing with this today, but this is a liberal leadership program that uh, lasts for two years, and that's the fifth time, so almost 10 years. Let's start with the feeding forward. We'll take the workshops by number, so I'm sure I don't forget anyone. So these are the happy faces for the new working group on citizen science, and the workshop title was Citizen Science Explained. So we'll run a, a quick slideshow. As Odell, and I am a deep sea diver. Though I don't get my thrills from the catfish in China. Thousand dreams, so many I have dived on, but still I'm all alone. Can't you see? It's possible and no, oh, oh, so probable. And by, by the way, by the way, it must be incredible. And oh, 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 so bad I'm falling every single way. Um, I've just attended the Lieber Citizen Science Workshop and it's given me um, lots of ideas about how I can go back to my own university and have a conversation about how we take citizen science forward. An excellent and engaging workshop on citizen science where we work through how we as librarians will take the concept of citizen science and bring it back into our own libraries and implement. So here are the happy faces again, and they will come on stage because I have a question for you. You had around 40 participants, and here is the question I'm going to ask. What would you be your first advice to a library leader who's wondering how he can place the citizen science as an item on his or her university agenda? I will say, first of all, uh, a strategic approach. It's extremely important for libraries to have a strategic approach and do partnerships with faculty, with external members, with the public. And second of all, I would say that it's not really that hard to get started. A kickoff event with motivated researchers within groups of where the hotspots are, are a really good first step. And on, on management side, um, we, we recommend when thinking about implementing citizen science in your universities to stop be driven by fears and start be driven by hopes. So instead of saying when someone is coming and say something about citizen science, instead of saying, I'm afraid that, you should say, I hope that. That's the recommendation. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Let's move to ladies now for digital humanities. This was your workshop. <laughs> Landscape of European DH libraries, you run a survey, and you can see that will be the same thing on every slide. On top, there's a, some kind of a tagline that uh, meets the purpose of the workshop. And here, you can see the participants' feedback. I have a question for you ladies. So you had 48 participants. Can you highlight the main need, main opportunity that emerged from the survey that you conducted? Yes, I'll do the, the main opportunity. Because the opportunity with digital humanities for libraries is that you can broaden the use of your collections. So um, if you look at your collections as a data set, as opposed to um, uh, researchers using single documents, you have this whole new target audience. And it is a very valuable uh, collaboration that you can engage with, uh, with your research community. And I think the other element we found was that it's around about the funding and the resources, um, a frequent challenge in lots of different areas, but just looking at how you can start embedding DH within the core work and how you can kind of maximize using both project and other elements of funding to take things forward. Many thanks. So workshop number three, towards the skill set and showcases by the Digital Skills Working Group. Kira, I have a question for you because you were in the uh, task force about the digital skills list. So here is the question. What is the top three skills that research librarians need to have to further implementation of open science in their institution. You had 36 participants. Can you wrap this up for us, please? Okay. So this has, before I give you the answers, what I think, um, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, intro on the work that Cecile and the Libra Working Group is doing, that Cecile is leading on before the workshop in surveying European countries to identify examples of best practice in developing open science skills. And one of the questions in, those survey, in that survey is, what skills do you prioritize? And consistently, we have uh, in the, we have six responses from six European countries so far, and the top priority for uh, four of the six is data. And that came through in the workshop yesterday. It's fair data data skills, data mining, data visualization, um, carpentry uh, as a, a method of upskilling in data. So I think data is the top one. Uh, scholarly publishing is second, and that has been you know, uh, in existence for a little longer, but that's certainly a very high priority. And I think the third one is not so much um, the technical skills, but more around influencing and um, convincing the research community and faculty of the need for these skills. So those are my three uh, top, I think, data, uh, scholarly communications, and influencing skills. Thank you, Kira. Then there was a joint workshop led both uh, by DH and by Digital Skills uh, with the shock. Um, these slides are rather written because there were so many participants and organizers that it was important to leave you some time to, to discover it. It was a complex uh, workshop. So, Vaso, can you answer <laughs> this question? Because there were more than 100. Yes, this is not yours, but you can answer anyway. <laughs> that's the question. That's the same one. You had okay. almost 100 participants. So, uh, what are the two main results? Um, we're, the thing is that, the, um, um, first of all, we were glad that we had this collaboration because it was a collaboration between uh, the Shock Project and uh, two of Lieber's um, uh, working groups, uh, two that uh, are really relevant to the work that we're doing there, uh, given the fact that Lieber is uh, leading the work uh, on engagement and training. 
Um, it was uh, a good thing that we had the opportunity to also collaborate with Clarin and Daria and, and, and Dance, and thanks to the, to the colleagues that uh, did that. Uh, two main things are that, well, first of all, we cannot have results yet because it's, it's a project that just started six months ago, but in order to create uh, this uh, part of the EOSC that uh, will be adapted to the SSH needs, uh, we need the input from the community. So um, uh, the fact that uh, we, could, we had the community there and uh, you gave us your, your input and uh, we, can, uh, we are going to contact you uh, for, uh, for more uh, is uh, more than helpful for us uh, building it, but I think also for the community because it, it's going to have a bottom-up approach. So it's not going to be something that is going to be brought to you and you will be asked to use it. So, um, so you're a hard worker and yeah. you ask us you. to work more. <laughs> Thank you, Vasu. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Matthias, your working group on linked open data is rather a new one. It was created last year, if I'm not mistaken. This year, you had this very nerdy moment. <laughs> I can see on the photograph, I really like this one. I think it's my favorite. And it was good to hear about actual use cases of linked open data. I'm very curious about it. So please, can you highlight the main need and the main opportunity that emerged from the workshop? You had around 15 participants, if I remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, from the survey, um, the sort of the main takeaway uh, was that um, that there is a huge variance uh, in, in how library uh, linked to open data is being published. And some of that variance stems from the fact that uh, library data itself is very varied. You can, you can publish all sorts of things uh, in linked and open format. Um, but some of that variance is, is certainly uh, sort of unneeded and, and uh, maybe unwanted, uh, and that uh, certainly poses us uh, an opportunity uh, in that much of the sort of the guidance and, and information on, on uh, uh, linked open data publication, it, it comes from different sources and not many of them, or well, almost none of them, uh, are aimed at, at libraries. Uh, and there we have a chance to um, if we manage to, to uh, build this kind of a more unified approach, uh, maybe th and and uh, and publish a, a sort of best practices type of document, uh, there is a huge opportunity there uh, for more uh, more interoperable uh, library linked data, uh, and uh, and especially with a with a guide not just from a like a, from a technical point of view, but also and maybe especially. Uh, from a sort of librarian point of view. Yeah. Perfect answer. Many thanks. I think I'll have a, a deeper look into it. There were 57 participants for this very long titled <laughs> workshop. And a workshop that uh, was uh, a joint one between EUA, IFLA, EBLIDA, LIDBER, and Spark Europe. Since this is a feeding forward meant to show you the LIBER faces, people who are involved in working groups, maybe people you want to contact afterward for extra information or for working with the groups. Benjamin White from the British Library is with us today. And I have a question for Ben. With the copyright directive reform recently voted, what's our most critical issue? So the, um, yeah, so thank you for the prize for the longest title of a workshop. That's uh, my, my pleasure. Um, what we were trying to do in, in, in the workshop was really try to engage with uh, library directors and senior library colleagues to understand what they need to engage in policy formation. So we have a lot of legislation like copy, the co revised copyright directive, the public sector information directive, which brings research data in, into scope from universities that's got to be licensed on level playing field terms. So there's a lot going on at the policy level. And um, what the most critical issue was engage. 
please engage with the implementation in your member state. So what we were trying to what we were trying to do was encourage people to understand more about the law and how it will affect libraries, but also to find out what they needed from LIBA in terms of support. Because a directive can be implemented very well, a golden opportunity, or very poorly, lost opportunity. So we have two new laws for text and data mining, and they could, if implemented badly, essentially mean that text and data mining under an exception that we won cannot take place. So we, what we're trying to, because it's so complex and it's lobbied from publishers, so actually we get this new law, but we can't enjoy it. So what we were trying to, the critical issue was engage and what skills is it that, that, that you need from Libra to engage. So please contact us if you would like to engage in policy formation in your own country to let us know how we can help you to help yourselves. <laughs> Many thanks. So for contacting the working groups, of course, <laughs> this is on the Liber website. The Liber website, you know it, all right. Another new working group on innovative matrix with Charlotte. That was your first workshop and you took a roadmap out of it, let's say, some, something like this, very inspiring workshop. Well, where to from now? That was the title of the workshop. You are a new group. Where to from now for your working group? Well, last year we were given five topics by LIBA members to work on, and what we did for the workshop was actually we displayed, so to say, what we have been doing so far. And it turned out that half of us were creating new innovative metrics and the other half of us were disrupting them. So I think for, for the coming year, we will continue disrupting and creating new measures and we will work more intensively on the ethics of metrics as well. At the moment, the working group has 10 members one just joined during this conference. And if any of you would like to join this working group, please, please send me a note, because there's loads of work for all of you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So after these 20 participants group, let's have a, a look at the FAIR data principles, applying them day to day in our practice. So here is the tweet, thank you, Rosie. She knows it would be displayed. <laughs> I had the chance to tell her that. Can you? <laughs> Why didn't you put us both on the slide? Who? I mean, we, I mean the two of us as co-chair. Because I think I, I didn't have the photograph. The because there's Rob Grimm and I didn't, well, that was, my mistake. Just come forward. <laughs> so I have two people to answer one question. What roles and responsibilities have libraries in making fair a reality? I'll hand over my to, to my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you have a view as well. A we have two, <laughs> two microphones. And we've been so sharing this group for many, many roles. years. So. <laughs> um, well, I'm, um, in the workshop we had, of course, um, a range of topics, and um, I think it was evident that there's lots of connections, or was lots of connections between the presentations, and um, one thing is, um, of course, the libraries are getting ready, and the stewardship uh, role is, is getting more sophisticated, so we had Michael uh, reporting to us on, on the work they, they did, and I think we, as libraries, wrap our head much better around this um, role, I mean, in these days, and and also, I think the, the main role of the library is really to connect up with uh, with all these players and on campus, and and of course also nationally and internationally, and um, yeah, make make a fair a reality. I mean, we really looked into the nitty gritties of a fair from different perspectives. So, uh. hey, what you see is that a lot of progress has been made so far, but it's quite unfair to see that. Fair data that should be fair isn't fair at all. And I think that will give us work for many years. So um, like other groups, we have worked for years for you all. So uh, work for years. Join. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
So you had around 35 participants. Uh, the next workshop had 46 participants, and today Sophie is here to answer our questions. Here is a, a quick view on the taglines and the participants' feedback. But I have a question for you, Sophie, if you can join me. What can we all do tomorrow <laughs> to adapt our workflows and cost management to support open access book publishing? Oh, we can do so many things. Uh, but one thing is to, to uh, make sure to learn from the lessons that we have from other publication projects. Um, that metadata and uh, permanent identifiers need to be applied to books as well. We can't make up a new system. Uh, and, and we already have mechanisms for this in our libraries. Uh, and also to teach people that it's, e it's easier than it seems. Uh, we were talking just before, sort of, what is the problem, Lily? Why, why are, for example, planners saying that we're going to do OA books in five years, what is so complicated. I think both Elko, who's here, uh, made an excellent presentation on what's already been doing. We've done studies. We know what to do. So yeah, tomorrow we just need to start, start working on it. Uh, look at the good examples. That's what also the outcome of our workshop was. Uh, we did list a couple of good, good examples from different groups that's already been done. Uh, and we also have a long wish list of things we want to be doing. And that we will publish this, uh, all the data from the workshop and, and the survey eventually. So keep an eye open for more information about this. Because it shouldn't be that hard uh, uh, to, to publish open access books in the same framework. Uh, we also want uh, more good examples, so please let us know. The working group uh, will continue to work on any open access things, so not just open access books. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> many workshops and many questions, many issues tackled. Let's move on with the next one. 13 participants. And a very special one, because it's a local one, many technologies. This is what it looked like. <laughs> and the question here, what technologies most impressed me today, will be answered right now. Simon? Very impressed. <laughs> He's telling me, all right. <laughs> Are you here? Can you make it live? Give me your impression. Of course, it worked just before the plenary, but it's better to have you, Hilda, standing and talking. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that picture was terrible. Um, I was there at the session yesterday, uh, mainly because I'm very interested in seeing what happens here with our colleagues. But um, there were a few um, innovative tool tools presented, and um, it's uh, um, what I thought was really remarkable is the connection between the group that was working here at Trinity College Library with uh, um, the other universities in Dublin and also the computer science department in developing new tools. So that's what I said in, in this short interview that I didn't know was going to be up here. But <laughs> um, uh, it was uh, about what I thought would be uh, good examples of uh, a good connection between the library and the researchers. Many thanks for your live feedback. <laughs> and I have a, a question. Arlene, here you are. Hop. What is the open innovation research model? And how, where can we learn more about your cases? Yeah, thank you. And thanks again to Hilda for that, that live reenactment of your, your Vox Pop. So thank you. So just to say as well that the origin of the partnership came about as a result of a wide ranging discussion between the librarian of Trinity College Dublin, Helen Shenton, and the director of a science foundation, Ireland uh, funded research center here in Trinity, um, which really is looking at next generation um, digital uh, technologies. 
And so uh, by this, um, what do we mean by this open innovation model? Well, really we mean it's a distributed collaborative model. It's kind of open in the sense that it's kind of cross-disciplinary. Um, you know, it's about kind of co-development of research kind of questions and solutions to those um, research challenges and those research um, collections. There's an also an important element really, it's, not, it's about the library not doing it alone. The DAP Centre um, involves not just technologists but pedagogues, uh, lawyers, archivists, um, um, ethics researchers and so on. So that's another element to it. Yeah, and um, as you say, it's a bit of an unusual one. We had quite a large group, 12 uh, Libra delegates and uh, a group from, of um, librarians, archivists and digital humanists from Ireland. And so we produced lots of good things. We recorded um, the presenter, when they, the presenters, the six uh, wonderful presenters who demonstrated uh, their technologies. We have lovely videos captured and we're going to make those available. So that would, it would be great if you could look at those and, and interact with us and give us your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we had something special this year, 156 participants. For the first time, there was a newcomer session. Bertil from the board was, <laughs> was not a newcomer at all, but he was uh, overlooking this. This is what it looked like. And I have a question for Martine. She's here. Martin, he's here, sorry. You can call me Cecile, you know. That's no problem. <laughs> so what is the most unclear thing about Libre as a structure and about the Libre pre-conference? Right. OK. Um, didn't expect that question. Um, because actually, you know, the newcomer session was really good. Uh, and a lot of, well, there was a lot of explanation about Libre, but not too much, which is good, I think, at a newcomer session, so you understand something. But to be honest, I don't, I'm not sure if I can answer this question, but what I could answer is what I liked most about the newcomer session, and th that was the advice that Helen gave, because he said, the one thing you should do when you go to a conference like Libre is find your tribe. And that was really an excellent advice, find the people that you think are of interest to you or to other people, that was advice one. And advice two, which I even loved better, was lose your tribe. Um, connect with people that you're not familiar to, with topics that you're not familiar to, and I love doing that these days. Uh, I've been to three, well, at least two sessions that I know nothing about, and now I know at least something, which was really inspirational. So I learned a lot about Libre, but also a lot about the conference, and I think the newcomer session is really, really something worthwhile for a lot of people uh, who are here for the first time. So a big compliment for the, the organization for doing that. Yeah. A small club that is growing every year. I told you about the Leadership Seminar for Emerging Leaders program. And they have an alumni network that is growing every two years. This year it was, it gathered together 23 participants. And I'm looking here because there is Heli. And Heli, you told me that uh, it was about communicating, advocating. Yes. But uh, do you have something else for us? Yeah, well, we, we had a very nice pre-conference workshop, very lively discussion. Uh, everybody raised some key issue they wanted to discuss, and we decided to discuss on a couple of them. Gregor tried to, tried to convince to kind of approach the topic in a certain structured way, but a participant found the method a bit French, and they didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, anyway, we discussed on roles and responsibilities we need, in, we have already and we will have in the future in libraries. And we, uh, then we discussed that, uh, what, what kind of things we need. And we thought that uh, everybody knows that we have new roles and new tasks and new responsibilities, but we haven't been very good at communicating those outside the library. We need to attract people with new skills and competencies, and we need to keep them in the library, so kind of commitments. We also need to communicate better in, within the library, so kind of what we are doing, why we are doing it, and how everybody fits into the picture. And we also want to be seen 
uh, not just service providers, but as partners. So this was about, about our workshop. Thank you very much. So maybe it's time now for you to share your thoughts, because of course there won't be questions for 12 workshops at the same time. But the interesting thing is that we would like to know if you can give us an input. So here is the user's guide. Grab your phone, go online, and you will see here appear a code. 538040, you connect, and you will see some questions. There are three questions, and we have uh, quite some time to have a look at them. Maybe I can leave like a few seconds, and then we start. Oh, there is one person attending the workshop. That's good. That's a question I've been asking myself for quite a long time about workshops. When you register to a workshop, do you go there? And if not, then why? All right. This can keep going on. Uh huh. <laughs> a brave one. This is totally uh, total anonymity. You know, it's just a Wi-Fi here running. You know, and your guest password and all. <laughs> Okay, the most interesting thing is that for the moment there is a, a zero for I have no interest in the workshop format. The question would be then to know if uh, what is interested is because it's an active format or because it is linked to the working groups, linked to Liber, more than the workshop. Aha, there is one, so raise hand. <laughs> Someone wants to comment on his or on her answer, maybe. <laughs> Not particularly. Okay, so what can we see here? It's that there is a strong link. I'm, I would say it's obvious, but it's good to see it. Um, a strong link between the topic and the, the liber structure. I was quite surprised yesterday there was a meeting of participants and some of us said when asking questions or making remark you to the people who were on stage to the board and here i can see there is a big us so liber is made of its members so this is what we do with liber that brings us to this kind of results and I think that's, uh, that's quite interesting for the, for the future. Let's move to the second question, because we have a trend here clearly. What do you expect, or what did you expect if you didn't attend this year, from the pre-conference workshops? So this is a ranking. You answer first, then you have the second possibility appearing, and you can change on your phone. Okay, good to know. Let's keep voting, but we, are, we have almost 100 answers. And the ranking is the algorithm that makes the average. So this is very consistent with what we could see before. Topic first, format second. And this is what came out of all the feedback we had from participants and from organizers who we don't hear much. <laughs> Usually, collaboration, networking is a big part of Liber. A colleague 
told me, uh, told the, to, to a group just a few uh, hours before that networking is what Liber is about. And that's clearly, uh, that's clearly seen now on the screen. All right, discovering Liber activity that's outside from the workshop. Yes, probably this is more an achievement than a discovery, but still, for many of us, that can be a first step into the structure. Let's take the third and last question. And here maybe you need a, a little more time. We'll see the, the suggestions appearing on the, on the screen. you realize you are creating your own work, right? Yes, you do. So different trends are competing. This is why I'm just waiting a little longer. <laughs> but you realize this is a very strong input, both for the programming issues, but also for the working group roadmaps. All right, this is getting too much. Now I can't read, over 40. All right, thank you. We'll, we can keep voting. Uh, I think these will be kept uh, and used for the coming years. I would like to remind you that the working groups have different time frames. Some of them are meant to last for years. Some others are very short, have very short uh, lifetime. All right. No, I think, I think I'm going. <laughs> okay. I think we will stop here for the voting. But the thing is, uh, I, I would like to thank you when I say you, of course, I mean the organizers for the workshop, the working group chairs, the board, of, of course, that enables us to do so through the steering committees, but also the uh, um, partners we had, like this year with the Carpentries. Thank you to all Liber member and participants because you considered joining a workshop, maybe you considered joining a working group. And thank you, Simon, for <laughs> launching all this on the screen. I think we won't go further now. We will stop here. And there's a meeting of participants that is coming afterward. We will leave them some minutes to get prepared. And we will use all the data without tracking them in order to have a, a strong program for the next years. Thank you all.